Yes, let me just live stream to YouTube. Sorry, it's taking a minute. Perfect. Okay, we should be good to go. All good? Yep. All right. Take care, everybody. Um, this is our last uh, um, seminar for this semester. Uh, anybody that is registered for the class, please get your abstracts in. I'm not quite sure what David's policy is, but I will accept them right up to the last day of the semester. Um, uh, after that, um, you will be marked absent for that day officially, whether you're virtual or not. Um, but with that, we or I would like to introduce our last speaker of the semester. Um, I'm really looking forward to this one. Um, Dr. Anya Brown, who is presently a um, assistant professor at the University of California, Davis Department of Evolution and Ecology, um, will be presenting. You can see the title on the slide. But prior to that, um, Dr. Brown was, let's see, um, did her master's degree at uh, Cal State Northridge and her PhD um, was at the University of Georgia. And then she had a postdoc, actually, John and Kathy Yule uh, postdoctoral fellowship program at the University of Florida. And if anybody has uh, been with our seminar for a while, they know that Kathy Yule has been a regular um, uh, attendant for many, many years and uh, was at the Center for Wetlands uh, um, well back towards the beginnings. Um, so there's a nice uh, contiguation or continuation of uh, a legacy there. Um, but with that, uh, Anya, I will turn it over to you um, and uh, well, take it away. Great. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I started this position um, almost two years ago now and was at, at Woods Hole in between being at Florida and here as a postdoc. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, great. Oops. So when I say phenotype, what comes to mind? Maybe morphological traits like body size or physiological traits like growth rate or behavioral traits like escaping from predators. But what about the extended phenotype? And that's the effects of a gene that can go beyond the individual. An example that I really like of this are these two sister taxa of mice, one that, that makes short, simple burrows and one that makes long multi-tunnel multi burrows. It's this burrow length and burrow size that's the extended phenotype. It influences the survival of these mice and it's heritable. Another example that I really like are between hosts and their parasites, where the, the host is actually the extended phenotype of the parasite. That's the case between this trematode parasite and frog host. When infected, frogs grow extra limbs, making it easier for them to be captured by the next host in the trematode's life cycle. And more recently, the concept of the extended phenotype has been extended even further to include a host microbial partners. Host associated microbiomes, like those associated with host roots here, they can be and they can lead to changes in the host or the environment surrounding the host, and that can influence fitness. And so like burrow size in mice and host characteristics and parasites, we can think of the microbiome as a part of the host's extended phenotype or a trait of the host. And so one way I like to think about this is that we have different environmental conditions, whether they're abiotic like temperature and salinity or biotic like predators and competitors that influence the host, the microbiome, or both, and can lead to shifts in the, the host, the microbiome, or, or both. This could help species quickly acclimatize to changing conditions, but it could also have deleterious effects when stressors break down the associations between hosts and their microbial symbionts. And I'm really interested in thinking about this kind of variation that exists in nature in general, and the question that really drives a lot of my research and the research in my lab are what are the implications for variation in traits and in, in, in doing so, including microbes as a trait. In general, <clears throat> my work is um, fits into these four categories or four ecological concept areas, stressor effects on organisms and populations, or the variation in species response to stressors from microbial to population scales, <clears throat> 
microbially mediated species interactions, or incorporating microbes in our understanding of classical interactions amongst macroscopic species like competition or facilitation. Uh, adaptive plasticity, or how previous exposure environments modulate a species' future response, and whether this is mediated by microbes. And community phenotypes, the idea that there are indirect community-wide effects mediated by variation in species traits. And today I'm going to focus on a couple of these themes, um, trait variation, responses to stress, and the implications for populations and communities in three parts. I'll start with an uh, example, two examples from tropical coral systems, and then I'll end with an example from a temperate coral system. And so I want to just get us all on the same page about what is a coral. And this is a picture of a massive pyrites coral. If we were to zoom into it, or if we were to do a cross section of this colony, we would see a thin tissue layer um, and its skeleton. And so the tissue is producing the skeletal material. And so it's really just the live section is a very small layer. And now if we were to zoom in, we would see these small yellow rings, those are the polyps, and corals are, are a colony of interconnected polyps. Um, and these little rings here are, uh, are, are they look like, like small sea anemones. They're responsible also for heterotrophic feeding, so feeding from the water column. If we were to zoom in, though, into the tissues of the coral, we would see the microalgal symbionts, which is a class of, classic example of a symbiosis between corals, uh, um, uh, of corals, the Symbiogeniaceae, or these uh, microalgae in the family of Symbiogeniaceae are responsible for much of the food or much of the nutrition of the corals. They um, photosynthesize and transfer photosynthate to the coral host. <clears throat> Another major player in the symbiosis of corals are their microbes, and they can be found everywhere, but I'm really going to be focusing on the surface mucus layer, um, because that's the first part of the coral that's in contact with the environment, and the first part of the coral that can be influenced then by different, um, by variation in the environment itself. And I, when I say microbial community here, I'm really talking about the bacteria and the archaea that are associated with a coral. And they can be responsible for uh, nutrient cycling, as well as it's the first line of defense against potential incoming pathogens. And disruption of these communities can be indicated by differences in alpha and beta diversity and are typically associated can, and can be used to associate with stress. And one of the reasons why I think corals are a great study species for thinking about variation is because they show fantastic amounts of variation among species, within species, and that variation also includes variations in their symbionts, whether it's the identity or the amount of their microalgae, um, and the same kinds of ideas with their microbiome, their bacteria, archaea, and fungi, although again, today I'm going to be focusing on their bacteria. And it's this variation that's responsible for <clears throat> the communities and ecosystems that are characteristic of the, of the tropics. Yet we all know, particularly living in Florida, that these ecosystems are experiencing massive population and community losses due to a variety of stressors. And one of those stressors that's more specific to South Pacific reefs are vermited gastropods. And so I'm pointing out here five vermited gastropods. They're called, um, the largest species is Sarah Signum maximum, and they're really not your typical snail. So instead of looking like what you would find on the beach with a coiled shell, <clears throat> these snails um, are embedded into the reef matrix. So in their larval stage, they settle to dead parts of the reef because live coral tissue kills, that, kills their larvae. Once they have attached to the reef matrix, that's where they'll reside. And since they can't move, they produce and cast out a mucus net to feed. So here you can see it, I'm pointing to it, it looks a bit like a spider's web. It covers the substrate and collects any particles that fall into it. And the snail then pulls the net back in and consumes both the net and all of its contents. And it's this mucus net that's been implicated in negative effects on corals. We know that it's associated with lower coral cover. It reduces coral growth and coral survival. It influences the algal symbionts by lowering photosynthetic yields. It also lowers water flow at coral surfaces. And so that net covering corals really leads to this low flow layer 
um, at the coral surface that can influence oxygen dynamics. It leads to flattened coral morphology. So instead of a rugose or bumpy um, texture, corals are flatter when the, when the snails are present. And it has community effects as well. When the nets are covering algae, it decreases herbivory. And these are have um, initially were really strong deleterious effects, particularly the vermeated effects on coral growth. However, as time went on, many scientists, myself included, noticed a decrease in the effects of the snail on the coral. Sometimes there was really no effect of the snail on coral growth, and sometimes it was a really weak effect, which was surprising given the this the snail's propensity for being a strong negative um, stressor for corals. So what happened to the effects of these vermeids on corals was a question that I had asked towards um, uh, the end of my time working with them. Well, one thing that occurred over a, a, a almost a decade was there was a, a sharp increase in the snails following disturbance events between 2008 and 2010 that led to more open space and more um, areas for the vermeids to settle to. And so that meant that with this population boom, there was more interaction between the, the snails and corals. And so because also we know that corals are highly plastic and have microbial communities that are plastic, potentially this increased contact might have de decreased the effects that the snails had on coral growth. <clears throat> So another way we could think about this is does previous exposure to vermeids decrease their effect on coral? And really I'm really asking, is this an example of adaptive plasticity to the presence of a stressor? And just as a reminder for what is adaptive plasticity, I really like this example from Old and Relia 2011, where um, uh, Physa acuta snails, so these are normal looking snails, not like the vermeids, um, when in the presence of predators grow larger, thicker shells compared to when they're in the absence of predators. And then upon a secondary exposure to their um, uh, to their crayfish predators, we see a small effect on those that have been previously exposed and a large deleterious effect on survival for those who had not been previously exposed. And for these um, small uh, coral heads, we see different exposure histories. Some corals, Vermeids are not present on at all, so vermeids are absent from them. And on some corals, vermeids are present, so there are vermeids on them. <clears throat> and so what I would expect then, depending on exposure history, for those that had a, a previous, ex uh, those that did not have a previous exposure to vermeids, I would expect to see a large deleterious effect. So something like this, where we have traits on the y-axis and transplant um, um, to a vermeated absent or present reef on the x-axis. Here, this is indicative of a large deleterious effect of the of, um, when, when transplanted to a vermeated present reef. Whereas corals that had been previously exposed to vermeids, I expect to see a small effect. So not much in a, of, of a deleterious effect when exposed to vermeids a second time. And so to test this hypothesis, I conducted a reciprocal transplant experiment, taking corals from either vermeated absent or vermeated present reefs, and then transplanted them back onto vermeated absent or present reefs. And the traits that I focused on were skeletal growth or calcification, tissue thickness, which we can think of as a proxy for energetic reserves, where thicker tissues indicates more energetic reserve, symbiodiniaceae density, or we can think of that as resource acquisition potential, and microbial communities, the bacterial communities, which we'll think of as a stress indicator as um, alpha diversity increases. So indicating a disruption in the um, expected relationship between the corals and their bacterial communities. And this is what the what the corals looked like while they were on the reefs. Here are the small parietes corals um, in the presence or absence of the vermeids. I'm going to walk through these first sets of results a little bit slowly, just so we're all on the same page. Um, for the next several graphs, trait will always be on the y-axis and then transplant reef on the x. For these points, the inner circle represents the previous exposure environment and the outer circle represents the transplant environment. So when they match, the corals have been transplanted back onto their home type reef. 
Um, and so this is what corals that had not been exposed to vermidids before when transplanted back onto um, vermidid absent reefs. This is what their growth rate was. And when transplanted to vermidid present reefs, we see a decline in their growth. So this is that expected deleterious effect of vermidids. Okay, so for corals that had been previously exposed to vermidids, we see increased growth and we see, although a deleterious or a lower growth, um, lower growth in the presence of vermidids, actually higher growth once um, the vermidid stressor has been removed. So we see both an effect of the previous exposure environment and the transplant environment. In general, this is a plastic effect, a, a response that we see also with the microbial communities where, where transplanting to vermidid present reefs lead to increased alpha diversity, and there's a shift in bacterial concentration or uh, community composition with a um, tra uh, with transplant environment. So transplanting away or um, to vermidids leads to a shift in the coral microbiome. And some of those shifts are associated with different families, and those families have different characteristics. So one of those is the Fusobacteriaceae. So when corals are transplanted to vermidid reefs, we see an increase in this family associated with anaerobic conditions. And when corals are transplanted to vermidid present reefs, we see a decrease in photoautotrophs like Sinococaceae. Um, this might be driven by that low water flow on coral surfaces that are leading to anoxic conditions. Um, favoring then bacteria that can withstand those, um, those low oxygen conditions and not favoring those that, um, that could be photosynthetic or um, photoautotrophic. So generally these results, these plastic results indicate a deleterious effect of vermidids and an indicator of stress and not um, adaptive plasticity. But interestingly, we do see also traits that did not show plasticity, like we, um, Symbiogenaceae densities was always higher on corals that had not been previously exposed to vermidids, and tissue thicknesses were always higher on corals not exposed to vermidids. <clears throat> um, and this was a, 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 strong, um, uh, a, a strong effect. Then we also saw other, shows, uh, other traits that showed effects of previous exposure environment. So why would previous exposure matter? Well, maybe it's not that it's previous exposure because I've been really concentrating on the effects that vermidids might be having on corals, but perhaps it's just that there are some corals that have different propensity for colonization by vermidids. And so what that's, what that's really asking is that there's genetic variation among corals for those that have vermidids and those that do not. And the answer to that is yes, there are consistent genetic differences between these reefs. Corals that um, vermidids are not present on are consistently different um, um, than corals that do have vermidids present. And in this 700 base pair fragment, there's about three sites that are consistently different based on a CO1 region. So what that means is that going into this, really the presence of vermidids depends on genotype. And I think that's pretty cool. And it brings to mind the concept that I started with today that the extended phenotype of the extended phenotype. And if we were to take this one step further, like um, Thomas Whittem has in the past and thinking about the consequences of the extended phenotype um, for, for communities, that might be what's happening here. And an example I think like of this to, to, to clarify what I mean by this is, the, is between Pinus edulis the dominant member of pinion juniper systems, which has different genotypes um, um, that show different susceptibility to a herbivory by these moths. Some are resistant and some are susceptible. So the moth is part of the extended phenotype of the tree, and it has these, and it leads to community consequences, including the destruction of shoots and turning trees into shrubs. It can influence seed dispersal and um, fungal communities. And so the extended phenotype of the tree can have these wide-reaching effects for the community, uh, the, the pinion tree, pinion juniper communities at large that are potentially heritable. And I think this is analogous to the coral system that I've described, where vermidids are actually part of the extended phenotype of these corals can have these different effects 
at the community level. <clears throat> and I think then this is driven by differences in traits of the coral um, that lead to, that can have these widespread community effects. So if we have a we have a resistant to colonization and a susceptible co to colonization phenotype, gen uh, genotypes that have different phenotypes that I expect influence their ability or the ability for Vermeas to colonize them. So in this, um, so for the resistant genotype where there's higher, symbi higher symbiogenesis densities and thicker tissues, there's more resources available for healing after a a partial mortality event leading to corals that are are um, that are able to heal quickly and maintain that co complete coral or 100% live tissue status. Whereas corals that are susceptible to colonization tend to have lower symbiogenesis densities and thinner tissues. After a damage event, there aren't they aren't able to heal as quickly. Remedids are able to settle to them and lead to the different deleterious effects that we've seen um, in the past in the future and a mosaic of different organisms that are um, that that can settle to them. And so what this means is that potentially with these different phenotypes, it can lead to different reef trajectories, one that promotes higher coral cover and one that might promote lower coral cover. <clears throat> but vermidids are really not the only stressor on reefs. And in fact, they're a quite a small localized stressor compared to some of the large, um, uh, large scale stressors that are, are facing reefs today, for example, coral disease. And this is a map just showing um, the number of diseases found in different tropical locations worldwide. And really a hot spot of this is in the Caribbean. And what I think of as the poster child of coral of diseases is, is white band disease. And so if we were to zoom in on this Acropora cervicornis cor coral, I'm pointing to right here, um, an example of white band disease. Here it is close up where you can see the tissue sloughing off, leaving behind a bright white skeleton. And we know that white band disease is infectious and it can transfer the occurrence and through direct contact between colonies. And there are a few putative pathogens identified. And it has led to the widespread loss of these corals in the 80s and 90s um, across the Caribbean, in part due to the loss of these colonies and, and uh, loss of these coral species and many others, there's been a huge effort to restore coral reefs through coral nurseries. And here's an example of one of the coral nurseries, um, uh, a coral nursery in the Caribbean. This is from the Central Caribbean Marine Institute um, and a PVC frame housing many different colonies here and then just many different frames arranged in their coral nursery at 60 feet. <clears throat> um, and corals in this case from this nursery have been sourced from different donor colonies or different um, genotypes from around the island, each represented by a different color here. And because coral nurseries are also a common garden when they're grown together, we know that there are genotypic differences in um, um, in, in, in uh, different traits like growth, as well as a genotypic variation in microbial communities where the reds and greens and yellows show variation in their microbiome. Although if we were to look closer at this, we actually see there's quite a bit of, of, of homogeneity in their microbial communities as they're all dominated by this one bacteria, Candidatus aqua rickettsia. <clears throat> Yet nurseries, especially in nursery in water nurseries, are still affected by many of the environmental stressors that are um, influencing coral survival today, including disease. But because there are they are a um, a set population, it allows us to ask questions that we might not be able to easily ask in um in wild populations, like what factors influence disease spread and what are the microbial shifts associated with disease when we can catch disease early on because they're being monitored so continuously. And so that's what we did um, in this uh, coral nursery at CCMI. We first noticed the disease in early May, and then we monitored, our, monitored the disease weekly um, for six months. And what this means is that a team went down and then identified the health status of each colony in the nursery. So it's for each of 30, about 30 frames and 650 corals were monitored weekly. This was not possible without the 
amazing col collaborations with CCMI and their restoration manager and um, students from the University of Florida. And so this is what the disease looked like <clears throat> over, uh, over that six month period. Orange represents the healthy colonies, gray the diseased and black the dead. We can see that there has been some uh, recovery, but I'm really gonna focus on the, on the disease right now, where it, which peaked in about June, July. And here's just an example of what the corals looked like on one of those frames. We see the healthy colonies um, with completely brown tissue, diseased colonies like this one here, where there's some indication of white band disease, or that bright white, and then completely dead colonies as well, where the entire colony has turned white. And because we were monitoring corals on every single frame, we can look at, at the how the um how we can look at the frame by frame variation in um, disease progression, which is what we what we're looking at here. And I know this is a little bit intense because we have I'm showing you a lot of data, um, but I just want you to to see if anything pops out. And to me, a pattern that really popped out, but there there were some frames where there was consistently um, more healthy colonies than diseased. And so something that I haven't mentioned to you yet is that there are there is also differences among these frames. And there are differences in the mixture of genotypes depending on frame. On some frames, there's a mixture of three to seven genotypes, and some are represented by only a single genotype. And this allows us to ask questions um, in disease ecology, for example, like about the dilution effect. And this uh, the dilution effect in a nutshell is this idea where you if you have a mixed species group, or in this case, um, so in the picture here, it's a mixed species group, or in the case that we're talking, I'm talking about is a mixed genotypic group. We expect to see lower prevalence of disease compared to with a single species or a single genotype group where we expect to see higher prevalence of disease. <clears throat> and so we're able to look at that here just by separating the present, uh, the single genotype frames and the mixed genotype frames. And in fact, yes, we do see lowered disease prevalence on the in purple here, the representing the mixed genotype frames compared to the single genotype frame. So mixed frames show disease resistance. When what might be driving this effect? Well, potentially, what's happening is that the presence of res re resistant colonies are interrupting the flow of disease or the progression of disease. And that is what we see. So for for um, the Y and the R genotypes, we see that they're uh, higher prevalence of disease on single genotype compared to mixed genotype frames, indicating that they're highly susceptible to the disease. Whereas the G genotype, it shows resistance. So although when it um, uh, generally showing lower disease prevalence, no matter which frame type it's on. So what this suggests is that differences in disease susceptibility are driving these population level disease resistances, disease resistance. And I think when I, what really struck me is when looking at frames that where the resistant genotypes were, were present, we basically just see healthy colonies. Whereas frames where, this, where it's only susceptible genotypes, we saw disease and death. We were also able to capture some of the early microbial shifts associated with the, the disease by sampling the coral mucus of healthy colonies and colonies um, with disease lesions. So we sampled the healthy colony and then on a diseased colony, we sampled the lesion and a healthy part of the colony away from the lesion. In general, we saw consistent differences in the um, microbial communities associated with tissue health status. So healthy tissues consistently showed um, communities that were similar to each other and diseased tissues consistently showed um, uh, microbial communities that were, were uh, um, similar to each other. And there were several bacteria that I'm highlighting here that were associated with um, or increased or that increased in the presence of disease, including this Vibrio, which has been previously implicated in causing white band disease. I want to focus though on this bacteria here, where healthy corals show high abundances of this one genus, Candidata, Candidatus aquariquetia. 
Um, and what's interesting, we, we're seeing this associated with healthy tissues, but what's interesting about this bacteria is that it's been previously associated with disease and stress and high abundances are associated with susceptibility. And in this case, we know which, um, which colonies are susceptible and which are not. And it doesn't seem to be as, it doesn't seem consistent that um, there are differences in abundance of this bacteria depending on susceptibility. But if we look a little bit closer and look at the identity of these uh, with, uh, within the genus, and so in this case, we're looking at effectively species level differences in this um, Candidatus genus. What we see is that the resistant genotype, the, the resistant coral genotype is consistently associated with ASV1. So one species of this ASV where the susceptible genotypes are associated with a diversity of, um, of ASVs. Oops. So what this might indicate is that different strains of different strains or different species of Candidatus aquariketsia could be associated with colony resistant resistance. So if we're going from the population to the microbial scale of disease here, at the population scale, we learned that the mi mixtures of genotypes increases disease resistance. And this is really the first time that the dilution effect has been seen in corals. We expect that this very uh, that this um, emergent population uh, phenomenon is due to variation in genotype resistance at the colony level, which could be mediated by differences in, in, in the strains of the dominant microbial taxa, taxa associated with disease resistance. And I'm really interested in thinking about how microbes might influence um, responses to a host distress and um, in disease as well as in other types of stressors. And I want to talk briefly about what role might, may microbes play in response to stress through thinking about dormancy, which is a ubiquitous stress response across the, um, across the tree of life where host physiological functions slow down or stop. And what the role microbes might play in this is through reshuffling of the bacterial or archaeal communities. They might be helping hosts prepare for dormancy by increasing nutritional reserves, as is the case for bears. During dormancy itself, microbes may be replacing metabolic functions to maintain um, um, uh, to just to, to, to maintain the host during that period where the host is no longer um, functioning or slowing down its functions. And it can also influence tolerance to, or fit, um, tolerance to stressors or fitness by going dormant in the presence of, of, of disease. And the northern star coral, Astrangia poculata, is known to be involved in a facultative symbiosis with microalgae, which allows us, when it's without the microalgae, to really focus on the bacteria archaea coral symbiosis. This bacterial and archaeal communities, this microbiome is really similar to tropical corals, so we can use it as an analog for stress responses. And it undergoes dormancy in the Northeast, where the host um, pulls in its tentacles, doesn't respond to any um, uh, touch, and stops feeding. And so it's a useful way of thinking about what microbes are doing associated with dormancy or associated with this stress response. And so to understand the microbial shifts associated with dormancy, I sampled corals throughout um, uh, a season. So I took samples in orange here in the fall before corals went into dormancy. We captured um, the corals going into dormancy, which is represented by this gray region right here. Um, sampled them throughout the dormant period and as they emerged from dormancy, including a period here where some corals had emerged and some corals had not. And what we found represented, I want to focus you right here, is as corals went into dormancy and um, there was a shift in the microbial community that persisted even as the corals emerged, represented by the purple colors here, um, when they had come out of dormancy. So there was a persistent reshuffling of the microbial community. <clears throat> Part of this shift is likely due to a decrease in alpha diversity. So as corals went into dormancy, they lost microbes and only started to regain some as they, as they emerged. And this again, this is what, what the corals that were dormant looked like. 
some of these shifts are associated with specific bacteria that were changing or changing in relative abundance over the course of the um, of the pre, during, and post dormant periods. For example, there was a reduction in pathogens as corals moved into dormancy. During dormancy, there was an increase in bacteria associated with chemical defense. And then as corals were in dormancy and coming out of dormancy, there was an increase in ammonia oxidizers or bacteria involved um, in, um, in nutrient cycling of nitrogen. And so as corals moved through before, during, and after dormancy phases, we saw a reduction in pathogens and copiotropes and photosynthesizers. This decrease in active taxa um, during dormancy was associated with increases in taxa associated with productions of chemical defense, potentially outcompeting those or removing those that were um, pathogens, and an increase in taxa associated with nitrogen cycling that continued as corals emerged. And so this nitrogen cycling story, I think is, it can be pretty exciting because the coral is not feeding, it might be the only way that they're gaining energy um, as through the, the bacteria. So potentially microbes are replacing ho host function during dormancy. So to wrap up today, I showed two examples of how intraspecific um, um, or even cryptic species variation and traits in response to a stressor can influence community and population responses. In the first example, depending on the resistance or susceptibility to Bermuda colonization, there is the potential for differences in the trajectories of reefs that could lead to either a coral dominated system or one that's a mosaic of different species. In the coral nursery, we saw differences in the population level disease modulated by intraspecific differences in colony intraspecific differences or colony of disease resistance, which has been which I suggest is associated with the microbial communities of the corals. And a big question I'm excited to continue to think about is how variation in host and microbial communities is is variation in host and microbial communities and what roles microbes might play in stress response. I think Estrangia is one useful system or one useful, useful model to think about because they undergo these regular stress events that they can recover from. And because dormancy is widespread, uh, a widespread host response, it might be a useful tool to think about um, uh, the microbial role in stress response and recovery from stressors. Um, I'm currently at the Bodega Marine Lab, um, which is the coastal campus of UC Davis. I'm, um, and I started my lab now about two years ago. Um, and we're located up north, about two hours north of San Francisco on the coast. And this is a picture of what the, the marine lab looks like, just in case you ever get the chance to come out. It's a pretty idyllic um, location. Right now, my lab is starting to think about ecological impacts of variation in hosts and microbes in coral reefs and in eelgrass systems. And so we're looking still at the tropical systems, but we're also shifting to some local systems um, um, around Bodega Bay. <laughs> and corals, we're continuing to try to understand how mixtures of genotypes influence coral stress responses and the role that microbes may play in that. In eelgrasses, we're starting to think about disease and um, studying eelgrass wasting disease using a disease pyramid approach. So to understand how variation in the host, variation in the pathogen and the, the and variation in, in the environment influences disease prevalence and severity. And I um, would like to thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Anya. That was really, um, I guess, mind blowing in my mind. Just the complexity level of interpreting these in ecosystems just went up an order of magnitude. Um, and thanks for like probably just a very small insight into that at this point. Um, so I guess we can open it up to anybody that's in the Zoom meeting at this point, and then we can go to Megan and see what's on online. But anybody either in the room or in Zoom land, have any questions for Anya at this point? Go ahead, Kathy. Go, I, you, I found I, myself 
um, fascinated <clears throat> in trying to, to think between these levels and the the uh, the picture of the mixed flock of birds versus the single bird uh, made, made me think about uh, efforts in trying to restore populations uh, that have been depleted for one reason or another. And it seems as though um, certainly diversity of species would be important. Um, but as you point out, genetic diversity within a species may be just as important. And uh, and I'm, I'm trying to think uh, if there are any restoration trials in, in um, vertebrates perhaps or any other species that actually do take the genetic uh, makeup of the, the, um, of the organism into account. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I will admit that I'm, my knowledge of restoration is pretty coral focused and, um, increasingly eelgrass focused at this point. Um, and I know for corals in particular, that considering genetic diversity is a really big, um, uh, there's a really big push to consider genetic diversity across uh, academic labs. And there are an increasing interest in that, I think, across restoration um, in, in restoration groups as well. In some ways for these, like for something like colony diversity, at least is one way that it's considered. Um, but I is think- it Is it expensive to, to look at genetic diversity? Um, it depends on the the depth at which you want to look at it. I would say. I mean, if if you want to determine, uh, yeah, I think it depends on on the depth at which you're interested. Like the DNA extraction part is increasingly cheaper, and if you're just looking at a small region, it could be as little as six dollars to sequence it. Uh, yeah. Any other questions in the room or in the in the in the room or the Zoom? Okay, Anya, there or excuse me, Megan, is there anything online? No, there's nothing on YouTube right now. Okay. Um, so Anya, I'm curious because of the fact, I mean, I know I don't know that much about that, but kind of um, adding on to Kathy's question, if if a program starts to clone a particular, you know, presumed optimal strain or something like that, that kind of flies in the face a little bit of what you're talking about. You really would want to have a much more mixed diversity, maybe cloning these mixed genetic lines. But even then, it seems like you're, you might be undermining the need to have a high level of uh, phenotypic, phenotypic variation within that genome, right? So, I mean, what are, what are your thoughts on cloning? Like if somebody says, oh, I have an optimal genotype. I'm going to clone that and then repopulate with that. Oh, so I, one of the messages I'm hoping that, that comes across is that the mixed, the, the presence of resistant genotypes might rescue some of the susceptible genotypes. And so it's more that the mixture itself, the mixture of different things together is an important way to maintain genetic diversity in a population. So it allows you to I'm hopeful that it's it's going to allow the um, maintenance of what are susceptible of, of genotypes that are okay. susceptible to some stressors, but not might not be susceptible to other ones. And mm -hmm. because we don't really know what the future holds, I don't think it makes sense to. Um, it doesn't always make sense to um, focus on one or two genotypes that are resistant to one type of stressor when we know that there's a combination of stressors and stressors that we couldn't, we don't even know what's coming for the future. So it's more important to me to create methods to maintain diversity or to increase diversity, genetic diversity in a population. Right. Kind of back to the whole natural selection thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's, it's to allow for natural selection to happen. Right, right, right. <laughs> exactly. You know. I mean, it, yeah, a challenging way to try to try to anticipate what some of the stressors may be. I know a lot of people are looking at thermal, you know, resistance or, or um, how do you find those that are more thermally sensitive? But like you say, don't 
don't then undermine the ability to to essentially counteract other possible stressors um, by selecting just for an optimal thermal um, uh, protective genetic or something like that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's um, that in my lab. Um, one of our our next steps that we're currently working on is to understand the um, kind of the standing variation to thermal stress and if if this same type of protective effects of diversity occurs um, when applying thermal stress to a system, to a coral system. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll find out. But I think it's equally interesting to also think about like how many of these traits or which traits are um, are kind of just, are, are if there are any that are stress resistant traits. So if tissue thickness, if that's a post-level trait that's um, consistently resistant to multiple types of stressors like disease and and um, temperature. I think that's an interesting, at least right now, thought experiment. Mm -hmm. And what role that microbes might play, could that, if there's some of the same mechanisms um, underlying the Kind of protective effects that the that microbes might might have um, against disease are those similar to those for other types of stressors? Mm -hmm. Do you think the the plant communities and the animal communities are going to have a similar sort of um, um, you know I guess response or or do you think this across the the you know, the animal kingdoms uh, or or is it? fundamentally in plant kingdoms or is this more focused like do you think there's more diversity here or what you're finding in the corals you're going to start to find as you look into other realms like the plants the eel grasses for for instance or do you think this is not unique to but you know much more dynamic or diverse in a coral system just because of its i don't know um, i mean it's not unique but it's it's got its its own kind of interesting symbiotic precursors that are already built in so yeah. Um, so recently, a, a paper came out from a group in um, the Northeast for this for eelgrass populations and um, planting diverse eelgrass um, eelgrass plants. I uh, I don't know if it, I think it was about resisting disease, but I'm not sure. But in general, we know that for eelgrass, there's they show variation in response to disturbance. And so um, it, it to me would make sense that there are some similar benefits to thinking about things at the genotype level. Like corals, eelgrass are, um, are colonial. So there's some uh, mystery also involved in whether you're getting actual diversity or if you're just um, sampling the same eelgrass plant. Um, but the folks, some of the folks that are, are at the marine lab right now have really shown that there's population level differences in response to different types of stressors, like, like heat and like disease, or hopefully we'll show that, that there's differences in disease. And so what that means for the whole population, I think is a, um, an exciting avenue, um, as well in, in eelgrass, because we do know genetic diversity is important for them. It's just what role is that playing um, and what, what role will that continue to play in the future and how to incorporate that in restoration. All right. Well, any questions pop up, Megan, yet? In, uh, nope. All right. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Anya, for finishing out our semester on a very high note. I really appreciate it. Enjoy Bodega um, Lab there. I've been there once and it's quite a beautiful spot. Yeah. 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 It's behind yeah. me right now. It's really, yeah. really, really nice. Great. Well, it was wonderful to speak with you all, and I hope you have a great rest of your semester. Great.